Hey, what's going on my friends? I hope you're all doing absolutely fantastic. Today, we're gonna to be talking about this right here. This is the True Color Variable ND Filter, but specifically in the use of an actual real world use scenario. So I actually created a mini documentary uh, courtesy of Nisi. They did actually help me fund this one. Uh, so big shout outs to them, big shout out to Pixel One as well that uh, hooked me up with these. And I'm gonna be discussing pretty much what these were used for in the mini documentary. And also obviously I used the Misfilter Filter as well. I don't go anywhere without a mist filter. This is the 1 8 uh, black mist filter. But uh, stick around at the end because we're going to go through a full breakdown of this, why these were used, and how they can actually help you in your creativity and also just in your general filmmaking or YouTube work, whatever you do when it comes to video. These are absolutely fabulous. So please watch this, uh, stick around, and I'll see you guys after the video. I can look back at every painting and remember a chapter of my life. Whether it was heartbreak, new love, or a random idea I came across in a book that inspired me. I've always been a really curious person, and my work is just a representation of something I was experiencing or exploring at that point in time. someone a true artist is their ability to be vulnerable and authentic and these kind of go hand in hand because you can't have authenticity without vulnerability. My name is Chloe and I am an artist. I grew up in Glen Innes, which is a small country town in Australia. I'm one of five girls and we lived in a house on the very edge of town surrounded by paddocks. I'm not sure if you've spent much time in the outback towns of Australia, but there is nothing to do. Everything we did to keep ourselves entertained came from our own minds and imaginations. I spent all of my childhood outside exploring, hunting for fairies, watching the clouds and creating imaginary worlds with my sisters. As I grew older, I spent more and more time in my room listening to music and drawing. At school, I felt like I was just counting down to art class and dance training. Paintings often end up resembling the night sky. Ever since I was little, I have been drawn, if not almost obsessively, to the stars in the sky. Looking up, there is so much that is unknown and the idea of endless potential is just so inspiring. It can be really difficult to balance work and my study with my art. I can go weeks without an opportunity to paint, which is almost unbearable for me. Because it's not about finding the time to just sit down and put brush to paper. Because passion and inspiration to paint from the heart needs so much more than that. And it's so important that we stay connected to ourselves. Creating is how I reconnect with myself. Landscape photography is another outlet for me to be creative. It takes me to the most beautiful places and it inspires me in so many ways. I think artists are just people who are more sensitive to the world around them but have found a way to channel all of that energy and emotion into their work. My mother is a watercolour artist and having such a creative parent made creativity something that was really valued in our family. I think it comes naturally that all of my sisters and I are creatives.
My family have always been so supportive. It means everything to me that the people I care about the most appreciate something that is so important to me. En plein air is French for painting outdoors, which I love. Painting amongst nature gives me so much inspiration. The most rewarding aspect of creating, sitting back and looking at a piece that I'm really proud of, knowing that I turned a blank canvas into something beautiful. I'm so inspired by natural beauty, especially space, the universe, the colors at sunset. I think it's so special that something so incredible is still free and we get to enjoy it every day. So what did you think? I absolutely enjoyed it. It was such a great time creating this, uh, specifically with my you know really small crew that we had and just working with Chloe and her sister, it was fabulous. It was just such a really cool time, but uh, definitely working with the R5C as well. I'm gonna be releasing a full video breaking down the Canon R5C because that was the first time I was working with it and I was shooting in 8K RAW as well. So there was so much data to work with and I thought it would be a fabulous opportunity because specifically the Canon R5C doesn't have internal ND filters. My FX6 does have internal ND filters, so this kind of isn't really suited to the FX6 because it's already got the variable ND filters, but you can still use the mist filter though because obviously no camera has a mist filter built in. But when it comes to having a variable ND filter, any other camera, this is going to be suiting it very, very well. So we all know one of the biggest things that you use an ND filter for is cutting back on the light because I had the Canon Prime lenses. I was working with the 50 f1.2, the 85 f1.2, and the 24 to 70 f2.8. Now these were all an 82 millimeter filter thread. I think there was one that was 77 millimeter filter thread, so I did have to use one of the Nisi adapters. But I wanted to use the 28 to 70 f2 but that was like an 85 or a 92 millimeter filter thread. It was huge. I couldn't use it because my filter wasn't big enough. That's on me. But uh, nonetheless, I pretty much stuck with the 50 the whole time. Uh, did 85 of my really tight close-ups and the 24 to 70 was just a few shots when I wanted to get something wide like a 24 mil because we all know the Canon i5C is a full frame camera. It's phenomenal, it worked absolutely brilliant in this instance. And when it paired with this filter here, it just absolutely hit the spot. So the Canon RF lenses were generally an F1.2. That is a lot of light that it accepts in. And your depth of field is very, very shallow. But the thing to counteract that, obviously you have to use your shutter speed. And uh, cranking the shutter speed is not a good idea. So you can see here at the first scenes when we got there, she was stirring and mixing the paint. And I wanted to shoot this with cranking the shutter speed and showing you guys pretty much what the difference is. And if you freeze frame, you can actually tell how sharp this is. This shouldn't be like this. So if someone is stirring like this, I'm gonna freeze frame right now, and you'll see right now that my hand is blurry. Now this is a show that the shutter speed is at 1 50th of a second or twice my frame rate. This gives the most amount of natural motion blur that we generally see in our eyes. Whereas if you really crank that shutter speed up, it is super tack sharp and it just does not look right, right? It's, you have to agree here. It doesn't look right when she's staring it. So I threw this on because it is one to five stops. There is just enough there to really dial it in. It was a very, very bright day as well. And I was shooting at the base ISO at 800. So already there's a really high ISO, there's a lot of light coming in, so I need to cut back on the light. That's where the ND filters come in very, very handy.
Now, specifically the F1.2, I really wanted to utilize that really shallow depth of field. I just wanted to narrow in on like small droplets of the paint. And the only way to achieve that is to shoot wide open. And once again, you're gonna be letting in so much light. So you have to cut it back to allow for that shutter speed to be one over 50. So that's where the ND filters come in very handy there. Now, if I did wanna open up the aperture and not use this, that is perfectly fine. You can do that but you're not telling the audience to look in a specific spot. So having a really shallow depth of field, you're literally telling your audience, hey, look at this very exact spot. And because I was waiting for the paint droplets to drop on the actual floor, if I had a really long depth of field, you wouldn't know where to look. But if I had that really shallow depth of field like I have, you're gonna see an exact line of how shallow that depth of field is, and you're gonna be looking at that exact spot because I'm forcing you to look at that exact line. So that is a great power of filmmaking techniques and utilizing shallow depth of fields and ND filters. Now, obviously when it came to the nighttime shots, you didn't need the ND filters, mainly for the fact that you don't actually wanna be cutting back on the light. You actually wanna get in as much light as possible. And that was really good because I had the 50 mil F1.2. Yes, I did shoot wide open, so it was a little bit difficult to get focus because I manual focused everything. I'm gonna be talking about that in the R5C video, uh, but you obviously don't need that. But I still used my mist filter, mainly for the fact that I really wanted a nice sort of dreamy glow when it comes from the fire. I just wanted to soften that look as well because 8K is very high resolution. It was very detailed. It's a really, really nice sensor from the R5C. So this just softens it a little bit. It blooms the highlights. And uh, like I said, I never sh shoot pretty much anything without a, a mist filter. The 1 8 is probably my favorite. Tristan uh, that was helping me, he was gaffer and grip. He generally likes that one quarter when it comes to higher resolution sensors. He's got the R5, so he uses a one quarter on his. Uh, but I do personally prefer 1 8. It really depends on you. I know some people actually use the one strength. Um, I've got the one strength uh, from me, see the four by 5.65 filters and it's phenomenal, but it's, it's a little bit too much for my liking on the FX6. It's not too bad on the A7 IV. So if you notice in the section when she was talking about landscape photography, it was actually shot in the morning, the next morning. So one of the things I did have to do is actually use this filter, but it, one. The biggest thing about this filter is that uh, it goes from one stop to five stops, whereas a lot of other filters actually start at two stops. And that is a bit too much when it comes to uh, shooting in slightly darker situations. Now the light was only just coming up, so it was faster for me to actually put the filter on and leave it at f1.2. And then when the sun come up, I could either drop the aperture or obviously bring uh, the variable ND down. And having it at that one stop was just perfect for ISO 800 f1.2. That let in just enough light that I actually wanted and I did really love that. And like I said, there aren't many filters out there that actually start at one stop. They generally start at uh, two stops to five stops. So that is a very big plus for the Nisi filter. Now, one of the biggest reasons why I wanted to shoot on this one as well is that I was shooting 8K RAW and it's obviously 12-bit color. So I wanted to get as much color information as possible. And this one is true color. I did a review of this earlier, uh, I think a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago or two, something like that. Uh, but it shows the differences between the Freewell filter, how much it has like a color cast. And this one is pretty much true to color. And I wanted that because I am a very firm believer in uh, if I'm shooting in daylight, I wanna shoot at 5,600 Kelvin. I, I, I know what daylight is and that's what I want my white to be because there isn't really anything that's sort of making any weird color casts. If I'm in a different circumstance where like this light right here, it's not 100% 5,600 Kelvin. So I'll, you know, adjust the A7 IV with a white sheet or a white card, gray card, whatever, and I'll do my white balance there. Whereas uh, this is pretty much true to color. So I will just set it at 5600 and I know my whites are going to be white. But if I use the Freewell filter, especially if it came to those sunset shots, it would have just been too golden and definitely just too warm overall. I would have had to correct that in post. Sure, I am shooting 12 bit. So there is a lot more color information to work with. So it does make it easier. 
but if you do have an 8-bit camera, it's gonna be very difficult to color grade if you mess up your white balance in camera or your colors in camera. So having a really nice, accurate uh, ND filter is really gonna help with that. Now, what I wanted to show you guys is pretty much exposing between different lighting situations. So let's say I was filming underneath the table. So this is Phoebe, this is Chloe's sister. I was filming her. Uh, it was a little bit dark because she was shadowed. So I had to really uh, tone this back to whatever it was, two or three ND. And then when she came up, I came up and obviously it was overexposed. So I did actually have to utilize this and make it darker and that is the great thing about having uh, variable ND filters is that you can smoothly make that transition uh, if there is too much light coming in and cutting it back to make it look like it is actually even exposure. That is a very difficult thing. I only shot that once because uh, it's a documentary. You're pretty much meant to stand back and just let things happen. Sure, you can say, oh, you know, can you do that again? But in this particular circumstance, I just thought it was the right moment. And I feel like it captured it at the right amount of time. And you know, I thought it turned out pretty decent anyway. But anyway, guys, that is it from me. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. That would be absolutely amazing. Subscribe to my YouTube channel already if you haven't. The link will be in the description below if you do want to check out these filters or uh, this filter right here, the mist filter. I, like I said, I always shoot with the mist filters, but generally the panel filters is what I use. But uh, yeah, I'll see you guys in the next one. All right, let's get it.